Disney Plus just released a new documentary about the legendary Howard Ashman. I just watched the documentary and I'm here to break it down and let you know what I think, so I hope you'll join me after the intro. Well, hello there. My name is Jeremy and welcome back to Freeform Disney, where I talk about all aspects of Disney, from the animated movies to the theme parks to Star Wars, Marvel, and Pixar, and the TV shows, and everything else in between. And that is why it's Freeform. And keep coming back every day for new daily content. If you're not subscribed yet, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Today we're talking about Howard Ashman, legendary lyricist and playwright. Now, if you had to name one person most responsible for the Disney animation renaissance of the 90s and, well, 89, which started with Little Mermaid, you could make a very compelling case for that person being Howard Ashman. So this documentary was written and directed by Don Hahn, who was a producer for Beauty and the Beast and worked with Howard Ashman in the production of the 91 movie. Now, this documentary includes new interviews with many key people in Howard's life, as well as using older footage and recordings, including pieces where we get to hear from Howard himself. It's a well-thought-out and directed documentary, and I must say I think it is well worth watching if you're interested in Disney history in this sense, or just Howard Ashman or the Disney Renaissance. Now, I'm going to go break it all down as we go through the life of Howard Ashman. So the first little bit of the documentary is talking all about Howard Ashman's earlier life and his childhood, talking about his acting, he created lots of stories when he was young, he was very creative, and while well, he really liked to tell stories through musicals, even as a kid he did that. Now he went to college, fit in really well when he was actually going through theater programs once he did that, and eventually he ended up moving to New York City. Now... As is a problem for a lot of creatives, well, sometimes you can't get the job you want there because it's hard to actually pay you the bills. So originally, the only job he could really get was as a book writer, which <laughs> sure as heck was not his interest. Even if he did get to do some work that was interesting, like working on a Disney one, which really was really neat for him. Even if it wasn't him <laughs> being a playwright or writing lyrics, etc. Well, he ends up creating his own theater. He starts it up, co-founds it. And this is a key turning point as far as his life is concerned. So it is a 99-seat black box theater over in New York City. And it's called the WPA. Now, it's not in the greatest neighborhood, and that was part of why people really questioned it, although it ended up turning out to be a great idea and would help him immensely through the course of his life. I mean, there were certainly hard times, too, because his relationship that he had with the steward, well, that's a relationship that had started younger in life that he'd known for a while, and it started to break down and, well, did eventually end. And the breakup hurt the theater because they were both definitely into the theater world, so that was one of those cases where, yeah, you gotta choose which one are you going with in the end. Uh, one of those nasty breakups in that sense. And we certainly heard from Kyle Renrick, who was, well, the WPA managing director. And you can guess which of the two directions he went. He went over with Howard Ashman, as did a number of them, frankly. Now, later on, as we're going forward in time, bring in Alan Menken. Now, Maury Yeston is the one who actually brought the two together, because Howard Ashman was looking for a composer at the time to go ahead and work on a project of his. And Alan Menken, of course, was also a lyricist, but that's not exactly the interest that Howard had at the time. Now, an interesting note about Howard Ashman is Howard Ashman wasn't a composer. He didn't actually play any instruments, but he could apparently hear it all in his head and was very specific when it came to what it was he wanted. Even though he didn't play any of those, he definitely could see it clearly. So the project they first worked on was Rosewater, one of Kurt Vonnegut Jr.'s novels right there. The two of them worked together, and, well, it did really well when they were first doing it. And the two of them worked together well. As Alan Menken said, he felt Howard Ashman had this pure creative energy, but they would have no holds barred wrestling when it came to working on the lyrics and the songs. And there was only one rule between them. You don't leave the room without a good song. And hell if they didn't come up with good friggin' songs. So what about Rosewater? How did it do? Well, over at the WPA, their black box theater, it did really well. 
But then they attempted to move it to Broadway, and well, that, that didn't work out for them. Trying to transfer and translate that play that was in a tiny space, where you're close and personal with everybody in front of you, versus Broadway, where you are way distant up in the audience, and it's got to be a bigger stage and everything else, it just didn't work. And it bombed. But what happened after that? Well, after that, Howard Ashman decided the next thing he was going to do was going to be something flashy and attention-grabbing, although not more than eight people, and there would be some kind of big gimmick in the middle of it. So what was it? Well, Little Shop of Horrors. And everyone thought he was out of his mind. But Howard Ashman being Howard Ashman, he was going to do whatever the heck he felt like. (laughs) Damn it all to hell if everyone thought he was crazy for doing it. He was still doing it. Now, Alan Menken and Howard Ashman worked together on this one, and Alan Menken even said that Howard permanently changed his approach to writing by approaching with writing one specific style and being able to do that for a whole piece. And that really went ahead and affected Alan Menken and his style as we've seen it through movie and movie after this. Well, anyway, they hit upon a dark style of grease for Little Shop of Horrors, and, well... If you've seen Little Shop of Horrors, whether as a play or as a movie, and I don't mean the original movie, that that's, yeah, something else entirely, you understand how well this one did. I mean, it was pretty much instantly a hit. Dang. Now, the funny thing about the whole thing is everyone was turning him down for having any shot of doing this play. So pretty much, if he didn't have his own theater, then it would never have actually gotten on a stage to be seen. This thing that turns out to be a giant hit never would have seen the light of day. But hey, as said, what Elvis, you know, he's got no musical talent. He should just be a truck driver, right? Same kind of idea. And then once you get out there, well, maybe you did have a little more talent than that. Well, it eventually got moved to the Orpheum. And then, of course, it got turned into an incredibly successful movie. So this really went ahead and changed the height of Howard Ashman and how much people respected him, especially after this came out. And this is where we bring in Bill Lutch, who became Howard's partner really for the rest of his life at this point. And their relationship got really serious really quickly. Now, here's where we start going into some of the darker side of this documentary. Because 1982, well, AIDS was becoming a big Big issue, big epidemic, really. And his old partner, Stuart, got sick with it. And Howard went to visit him all the time. It changed a bit of how he looked back on the relationship because you saw the good things rather than focusing on some of the bad stuff at that point. And then he also had a close friend, David Evans, also die from AIDS. (sighs) AIDS was horrible in the gay community and the theater community and, well, frankly, horrible just playing in general. And yes, heavily affected Howard Ashman's life. And more so than just this, but yeah, we'll get there. He wrote a play that really was a reference to some of this as well, Sheridan Square. And let's move on. Coming up next, he had the musical Smile. Now, he really thought this was going to be this huge hit. It was something that had been an older movie, wasn't a musical originally. In some senses, you can look at it as Little Shop of Horrors in that sense, because that smile, I think, was a fair bit bigger and more successful. There were some interesting comments by Jodie Benson about Howard Ashman, and she was brought in to talk because Jodie Benson got the main part here in Smile. Now, you might recognize the name Jodie Benson, because Jodie Benson was also the person who played Ariel, so you might just recognize that name right there. Well, anyway, she talked about Howard Ashman and how really he understood actors, because Howard Ashman was actually fighting for an actor who could sing and not a singer that could act. And that's an intriguing shift in the idea of how musicals actually were dealt with. You go back in time, and it was more about the ability to dance or the ability to go ahead and sing, and acting was secondary to that. But there was a major shift as we moved more to musicals that are focused on acting first. And you can certainly see that over the last few decades. Well, anyway, that musical smile, uh, ooh, it just did not go the way we wanted it to for poor Howard Ashman. So he was told no by the Schubert organization, the big, big Schubert organization, super influential. They thought was that they would take it up, but 
they were worried apparently about scaling it up in the costs, and so it came across as this huge betrayal to Howard Ashman. And all of that just made things worse between Howard Ashman and Marvin, who he's working with on the songs on the musical here. And, oh, it, it was just a mess. So he goes ahead and finds a way to get it to go ahead anyway, and gets it over on there, and, well, the opening reviews were really bad. Essentially, it closed really quick. It was incredibly devastating. And who knows where things would have gone for Howard Ashman if other things hadn't intervened. Who knows what his next project would have been and whether he would have gotten himself out of that slump in a nicer way. But what happened to happen was Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was head of Walt Disney Studios at the time, well, he caught up with him just right at the right time. And they talked about all these different possibilities because he really wanted to bring Howard Ashman in to work on some Disney musical movies. And apparently they talked about numerous ideas. You can see it in that letter that one hadn't got sent, which included, well, Little Mermaid as well as a few other potential ideas. And hey, so Howard Ashman went out to Hollywood. And, well, he certainly didn't fit in with the live action stuff that was out there, but animation certainly did. The animation crew were more his people. And what you know, Disney animation at this point in time is over in a trailer on a parking lot next to a bowling alley. This is the real low time for Disney animation. The end of the Dark Ages. But hey, the Renaissance is on its way. Now, Howard Ashman had grown up on movies like Pinocchio and Peter Pan. There were huge influences on him. So certainly Disney and its musicals definitely had an impact. And man, if he doesn't give right back there and create new epic Disney. Heck, Howard Ashman had this interesting comment where he commented that one of the last great places to do Broadway musicals is animation. He really didn't feel that live action worked as well for doing musicals, and frankly, musicals had fallen really, really out of style in terms of live action. Although we do have to note that he clearly pulled off Little Shop of Horrors as a live action. But I think he discounts it a bit because Little Shop of Horrors was not as serious of a musical. Well, anyway, some of the things Howard Ashman did for Little Mermaid. Sebastian, being Jamaican, for instance. That was a Howard Ashman thing. Complete change from what the directors had as a thought. The directors, John and Ron, who Alan Menken calls them very middle American white bread. So Howard Ashman definitely made some changes. Oh, and speaking of Alan Menken, Alan Menken got brought in to work on Little Mermaid because Howard Ashman essentially was told, hey, you've got your choice. Who do you want to work with? And that was who Howard Ashman wanted to work with. Remember how well they've worked together in the past. And dang if they don't on these upcoming movies. Well, with some other problems, but we'll get to that. Now, here's something that is really interesting. We talk a lot about the I Want song. The main character talking about what they are really wanting out of life and setting that up early and how important it is for really getting us to understand that character and identify and root for them. And now you can find this in some older Disney movies. You really can. But it didn't seem to be a lesson that had really been learned. So Howard Ashman came in and essentially taught the animators how to tell stories using songs and really gave them the importance of the I Want song and setting things up in the right way and how to use musicals and use animation to work this. And this was said by multiple different animators, producers, etc. And I find that so intriguing right there. And this really talks about how much of an impact Howard Ashman really had on Disney animation. When you have all these people talking about, hey, he taught us how to really do stories in this kind of way. Very intriguing. And people also talked about how, hey, you could go to him with, you've got a problem on this part of the movie or on this part of the animation or how to do it. And you could go to him with a number of different problems and he was good at coming up with solutions. Now, don't get me wrong, Ron and John still were the directors, but Howard Ashman clearly was heavily instrumental in what happened in Little Mermaid. Apparently, Howard Ashman might have even had some part in Ursula looking the way she did. Apparently she was originally intended to be some thin, high cheekbones, maybe punk type person. But the animators had numerous concepts and apparently happened to be in the room when the concept of the Ursula we know of was shown. So, hey, there's history of two for you. Well, we're coming closer to our tragic end of our documentary. 
So here we are, March 3rd, 1988, or over the 92nd Street Y. Now, it's important because just prior to this, Howard Ashman had taken a T-cell count test from his doctor. Now, it wasn't an HIV test because if he ended up being positive, that could actually hurt his medical insurance. Because he had been noticing some white patches in his throat, which is a definite sign of a compromised immune system. And, well, what they found out was, yeah, the T-cell count was really low. So this pretty much confirmed to Bill and Howard that Howard did have AIDS at this point. <sighs> yeah. Now, at this point, they were keeping it a secret because there's a lot of concern with how people would look at it. Look at Howard Ashman and what might happen to him, and, well, Bill by extent, if people knew. And so Howard was very against letting that out and making sure instead to keep things very secretive. One who, we move on and Jody Benson gets brought in to audition for Ariel. And, well, hey, there's history after that because that is our Ariel. And apparently, well, part of it seems to be that Howard Ashman brought her in, at least partly due to feeling bad about how Smile had just completely crashed and burned. Okay, let's talk about the I Want song over in Little Mermaid. Because that I Want song, super important. Well, Jeffrey Katzenberg, head of Walt Disney Studios, and this might be something you already know, because this is certainly not a hidden thing that's been talked about before. But he wanted to cut part of your world. Because he thought that it was going to slow down the movie too much, you'd lose the kids, and that was kind of one of those common thoughts at the time. And he said that Howard Ashman told him, over my dead body, and I'll strangle you if you try. <laughs> and they fought over this one. And Howard Ashman most certainly won. And thank goodness he did, because he was clearly right. Part of your world was huge, and it's so important having those I Want songs in. Now, Howard Ashman loved the process of making the films or making the musicals, etc., and really was about getting things right, even if it took more time, even if it took more money. In fact, to the extent that uh, there was even a memo about some people wanting him to maybe be fired because of how much time and money he was costing the studio. Yeah. Ooh. Yikes. <clears throat> Again, he was right, though. <laughs> Uh, his history's on his side here. Heck, speaking of history being on his side, Roy Disney even compared him to Walt. And just talking about the influence he had on everyone around him. That's a nice comparison to make right there. Oof. Now, Howard Ashman also became a little harder to work with at this point, probably in large part because of his fight against AIDS at the time. Keeping the secret doesn't help any because people didn't know that's what was going on, why he was acting that way. But it meant Howard Ashman had a lot more anger and frustration, and it came out at people in inopportune times. I mean, heck, Alan Menken talked about one fight they had and just how he was worried it was all his fault. I mean, he was crying over it, and whew, oh, what a mess. What a mess. I mean, heck, think about some of the things Howard Ashman did while hiding the fact he had AIDS. He spent two days at Walt Disney World on a press tour there while he had a catheter in his chest and queasy and going on roller coasters. I mean, dang. Phew. There was a nice piece, though, too, about the going to the park there because Howard Ashman saw the parade and the Little Mermaid floats there and it really touched him because he really felt that, guess what, this is really going to live on after he's gone. Well, the Tuesday after the Oscars, where Under the Sea went ahead and won Best Song, Howard Ashman ended up telling Alan Menken about the fact he had AIDS. And Alan Menken really didn't know it. You would think someone that close would, but part of it is that gradual piece of things changing and not noticing it. One of those, you can see all the signs once you know it, but you didn't see it beforehand. Howard Ashman said something along the lines of, Hey, I'm going to die, and I'm glad you're going to be taken care of how successful Little Mermaid had been, the name that Alan Menken's now starting to get for himself as well because of all of this. So that, that's, yeah, it's a nice sign of how much he cared about Alan Menken and the people around him making sure that they would be all right as well. Ugh, I can't imagine having AIDS and seeing that I've only got a few years left just to be in that kind of spot. <sighs> yeah, yeah. Well, anywho, Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast had started without Howard Ashman and Alan Menken, but it was turning out messy. So Jeffrey Katzenberg went ahead and wanted to bring Howard Ashman in. 
And in the course of that, that meant that Howard Ashman really had to talk to Jeffrey Katzenberg about the AIDS. And so they ended up, Jeffrey Katzenberg said, yeah, I'll work with you, whatever kind of changes we need to make. And so that actually made the whole production have to move up to New York as much as possible. But Howard Ashman still wasn't public about the fact he had AIDS, which means really it was coming across to everyone else that, hey, he was just some big diva or something, making them all have to pack up all the storyboards and everything else and go from L.A. up to New York just for him. Until they finally found out later, but yeah. So talking about Beauty and the Beast, that big six-minute opener of Bell. Now, they definitely felt that this might be pushing it a little too much, but they both really loved it and thought it was right. But they were worried about how people would react, the studio specifically. And Alan Menken talks about how there's that fear of rejection, and that for both him and Howard Ashman, the huge part of them that relates to the world, they relate to it through their own work, because that's their emotional conduit and how they connect. And so that makes the fear of rejection that much bigger because it's more of a rejection of you yourself rather than just a separated piece of work. Yeah, un understood right there. I mean, I can get a little bit of that sometimes here in terms of doing these videos. <laughs> sometimes. Well, anywho. So, yeah. It, well, first off, Bell worked great, but things were not going great for Howard Ashman here at this point. He's only got the energy to be able to do stuff for five to six hours. And Alan Menken talks about how there's the joy and the magic of making the movie versus Howard Ashman staring death in the face. And so that, that's working on Beauty and the Beast. But bear in mind, they also worked together on Aladdin as well, which was a huge thing for Howard Ashman. He had a big connection to Aladdin from his childhood where he'd even played Aladdin over in a play. So there was a big connection there. And by the time they were really working on Aladdin, Howard Ashman was openly sick. And Howard Ashman, oof, dang, as I said, the tragedy of, of dying of AIDS here. They wouldn't actually finish working on Aladdin together. He died before that. Alan Mekin talks about the days that they wrote some of Prince Ali from Howard Ashman's hospital bed. Even there, bringing a piano in to the hospital room just to try to keep doing that work, because certainly Howard Ashman, even there as he is dying, wants to keep doing the work, wants to keep... <sighs> Dang. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Howard Ashman is hitting his stride he is super successful. Look at Little Mermaid. Look what Beauty the Beast does. Heck, look what Aladdin ends up doing and getting cut down right in the middle of that. Ah, yeah, what a... Mm. World can be really fucked up sometimes. Let's just say that. Not that death is ever nice, no matter when it comes. Well, anyway, Howard Ashman. They talk a lot about Howard Ashman really wasn't political. He was very human. So a lot of stuff gets interpreted, but there's debate over whether he intended anything, say the mob song as a response to the AIDS hysteria. His sister thinks no, just empathy for people. That said, there's the song Humiliate the Boy, which didn't make it into Aladdin, but it would have been Jafar's song and talking about stripping things from Aladdin one by one by one, which feels like a clear reference to what was happening to Howard Ashman at the time, as he was losing all these different aspects of himself, would lose his sight, would lose taste, would lose the ability to feel sometimes, etc. And so certainly a connection to that and the raw feeling there, even if the song didn't actually make it in. Well, March 14th, Alan Menken wakes up from a dream, finds out Howard Ashman had died. And Alan Menken does the end of this documentary and, well, breaks down a little at the end, talking about Howard Ashman. Talks about and says that he was the force behind what all this has become. And it came from his heart and his intellect. And he didn't get to live to see it, but his work lives on. And boy, does it. Boy, does it. I mean, dang. We want to talk about even the three movies in Disney that he worked on specifically, talking about Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, let alone the influence he's had on everything else Disney Animation's done since. The influence, heck, on Alan Menken he had, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, and we do get to end. Right after that, we hear a song as we go out, and we get to hear it at Howard Ashman singing, just an older piece there. So, yeah, good documentary. Howard Ashman had a larger-than-life impact and greatly influenced everyone around him. And that certainly includes Disney and Alan Menken, as I said. And 
someday I'm going to make a video talking about Alan Menken, definitely, because I love his work. But you can't talk about Alan Menken without mentioning Howard Ashman. You just can't do it. There's too much of an influence there. Well, talking about Disney now, Disney is moving into a new era of animation, and we're yet to see how it fully develops. But you gotta ask this. Would there even be a new era currently developing in Disney animation if it weren't for Howard Ashman and his contributions to Disney? Legitimate question. I'm not convinced there would be. And that's just talking about how he influenced Disney, let alone musicals as a whole, even other movies. Yeah, he died in his early 40s, in his prime, when he was really starting to could have made huge strides. But he still had a giant, giant bigger-than-life impact. <sighs> Well, <laughs> let me close this out. So let me ask you, what about you? Did, did you learn something new about Howard Ashman from the documentary? Or heck, maybe you only watched this video. Maybe you learned something new here. What's your favorite song that Howard Ashman wrote? Whether it's Disney or maybe one of his other works earlier. Go ahead, let me know down below in the comments. And as always, everyone, thanks for watching. If you liked the video, please give it a like, share it with anyone you think will too, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done it yet already. I'll see you back here tomorrow for another new episode of Freeform Disney. Have a magical day, and may the Force be with you, always.